and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today we have with us Kevin Yates, and Kevin is the founder of an organization called Meals in the Meantime. So hello to you, Kevin, and you're going to talk to us about what it's like to be new to nonprofit and some lessons that you personally have learned along the way. So before we dive into this conversation, we want to remind our viewers and our listeners who we are. So hello to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and to myself, Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group. And we are honored to have the continued support day in, day out over the last three years thanks to our amazing sponsors. So I'm going to give a verbal shout out because they deserve it. Uh, so thank you so very much to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. These companies have been by our side, right, Julia? Like, Many wow. of them from the very, very right. beginning. So yeah. they allow us to have the conversations like we'll have today with Kevin uh, to talk about nonprofits and the lessons learned. But if you miss any of today's episode or any of our previous 600 plus episodes, you know where to find us. So check us out on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo. And if you're a podcast listener like I am, go ahead and cue us up wherever you stream your podcast. So Kevin, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Again, founder and president, Meals in the Meantime. Welcome to you. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here today. <laughs> you know, we're thrilled to talk to somebody in a, um, in a position like yours, which is really unusual, where we can talk with a founder and they can share with us what it's really like to be involved in this process. And um, so we're really, I think a lot of people will get information and inspiration about your honest reflections, you know, um, because it's so easy to have passion and excitement and then the reality hits and it's, it's a hard slog. Before we get going, I wanna mention that you're coming to us from Ireland, right? I am, uh, as we speak. I am in the lovely city of Dublin mm -hmm. for the very first time and absolutely loving it. And I'm representing the brand here in Dublin. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And I love your logo here. For so for those yeah. of you watching, I just that's a really uh, appealing and attractive logo. Tell us a little bit about Meals in the meantime, Kevin. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to to talk about my experience uh, and to talk about my nonprofit. Uh, Meals in the Meantime is primarily focused on serving the Chicagoland South Suburbs. And our mission is filling the food gap with nourishment and dignity. And that, that, that's not just a slogan. There is some intention uh, with that idea. And so when we talk about nourishment, we are focused on providing free, fresh, healthy, high quality food. Mm. Um, we are also focused on meeting specific and unique needs of those who need help with food. So in other words, there are people who might have uh, dairy allergies. And so we offer uh, plant-based milk as an example. Um, there are people who may not eat, say things like pork or maybe even beef. And so we offer turkey products. And so when we talk about nourishment, um, we also are focused on providing fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, focusing on nourishment and dignity. I think that one of the things that makes us very unique is how we engage with our pantry visitors. Um, we don't have any preconceived notions or biases against people who need food, right? And so there are many, many reasons for why someone may be experiencing a food deficit uh, mm -hmm. or food scarcity. Um, and so our perspective is not having access to food is not a condemnation. Um, we're right. focused on changing the condition. And mm -hmm. so when we have food pantry visitors, we see them, we acknowledge their presence, we say hello, we say good morning, we say, we are glad that you're here. And so again, our mission is filling the food gap with nourishment and dignity. And it's not just a cliche, it's not just a tagline, it's how we operate. Um, and I'm just super excited and, and so grateful to be able to uh, to serve 
the people who, who visit us who, who who need help with food. So that's uh, that's a little bit about who we are at the highest level. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, um, it, one of the things that I think Jarrett and I immediately could see, um, even when we started communicating with you about coming on the show, was that you do have a passion, and that's really important. But I got to get right into it. How do you start a nonprofit when you don't have a nonprofit background? You have plenty of passion. <laughs> I do. Um, and, and some of it comes from personal experience. Mm -hmm. and, and just to give you and, and our audience today perspective, uh, my background in terms of where I have been focused for the past, oh, I don't know, 25 years, kind of giving my age a little bit away there. <laughs> uh, my, my area of focus expertise and where I have been doing most of my work for the past few years is in training, learning, and talent development. I had the inspiration and the idea for Meals in the Meantime on March 9th of last year, to be exact. So on March 9th of 2021, I got the idea and the inspiration to help people who need food. And I do believe it was divine inspiration that um, that led me in the direction where we're headed with, uh, with the nonprofit. On a very personal level, uh, back in 2016, um, I was rolling right along in life, doing very well. Um, in my career, in my profession. And the organization where I was working had a restructure, a reorg. And as a result, there was redundancy in my role. And I found myself in a situation where I was without a job. Uh, I had a, a wonderful severance package and was able to leave the business with a really solid reputation for the work that I had done. But again, it was a business-based decision and one that I obviously could not take personally. And so fast forward a year later, um, I didn't have a job. Mm -hmm. And it was a very different, very uncomfortable place for me because up to that point, I had done very well in my career, um, was doing quite well financially. And again, just because of circumstances, suddenly found myself in a situation where I did not have a job. And so, you know, resources and money was a little tight. Um, it was a little tricky, um, you know, having to manage that. And, and so I did have my own personal experience for what it's like when you have a shift in a life condition, in a life circumstance, and how that kind of changes things for you. And, and so I do have the perspective for what it's like when you, when you find yourself in a situation that you didn't anticipate. And there are so many who are finding themselves in situations, circumstances, and conditions where it's difficult just to access food, right? And so yeah. for me, food is one of the most basic needs that we have as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, on a lot of levels, I, I have some reference point for that. And so I believe that that's where the passion comes from. So it's not me just doing something that I've heard about. Um, I have a reference point for what it's like when you uh, are at a certain point in life and suddenly you find yourself at a point that you didn't anticipate. And, and those are points of which resources and access to what you normally have access to shift very suddenly. Um, and, and so that is why we have the belief that not having access to food is a condition, not a condemnation. There are so many reasons for why people might find themselves in a situation why they are experiencing food insecurity and, and food scarcity. So, you know, again, to go back to your question uh, about the inspiration and the idea, I believe that it was divine, divinely inspired, um, and it also comes from a very personal place. Thank you for sharing that, Kevin, because I feel, you know, nonprofits exist for, you know, there being a problem in the community and you saw this opportunity slash problem, right? And you, you brought this uh, to your local community. What are some of the most important things that have come up for you, you know, and those lessons that you've learned since starting this organization? Wow, there are so many lessons. I don't know where to start. Um, again, going back to the idea that uh, nonprofit work is not my background. Uh, and so when I entered into nonprofit work, it was every single step of the way was learning. Uh, every single step of the way was growing. I think that, you know, maybe one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that while having the inspiration and the motivation and the desire to help, what sits on the other side of that as it relates to running a nonprofit is the business side and running and managing and executing and operating a nonprofit is very unique. And, and so there are, there are dynamics and some, 
uniqueness for running a business that is a nonprofit that isn't parallel to say a nonprofit business. And so I've had to learn about things like nonprofit financial management. I've had to learn about all of the government requirements as it relates to reporting. Um, I've had to learn about partnership management. I've had to learn about promotion, right? I've had to learn about advertising. I've had to learn about brand management. You know, to your point, thank you so much for your feedback on our logo. Um, That took some time. You know, it, it took some time to create a logo that I would be proud of and one that accurately reflects what we do. So, you know, the other part of nonprofit management, as far as I'm concerned, is brand management because um, we have a brand. Uh, our brand name is Strong. And then there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining that brand and promoting that brand. So it's all these nuances and dynamics on the business side um, that I did not have insight into because of my own background that even one year, almost a year and a half later, I am continuing to learn and, and grow. Yeah. Yeah. And it will continue to shift. Right. And I love oh, yeah. mentioned the financials because so many time I feel that nonprofits have board members that say, oh, we need to have someone in the baking industry. They can be our treasurer. But as you can see, you know, your part time controller as one of our amazing sponsors, they are dedicated to what you just said, that nonprofit financial management piece. And that, I think, has been like the biggest learning curve for a lot. Yeah. Um, you mentioned brand management. You mentioned, you know, so many good lessons learned. I'm sure all of that ties into success. So what has success looked like for you or how do you define success for four meals in the meantime? Yeah. And and before I answer that question, I want to go back to the financial management piece. This is not a plug. (laughs) And we didn't set this up so that your audience knows that you don't know this, but I brought your part-time controller in about six months ago. I think it is. Ah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting because I was driving around one day and I never will forget it. I was listening to National Public Radio, yeah, NPR, right. because I love NPR, um, and, and heard uh, an advertisement for YPTC. Your pipe, what is it? YPTC? Your, your part time yeah. controller. Yeah, I got it right. I got the acronym right. And I thought to myself, you know, um, financial management for nonprofits is, is not an area of expertise. And I'll tell you guys, for me, financial management and fiduciary responsibility is something where I will not compromise. It has to be 100% right. And I say that because we are entrusted by our donors to ensure that we are being responsible with their donations and their financial gifts. And so for me, the idea of bringing in your part-time controller, an organization who has expertise and experience with financial management for nonprofits was the absolute right thing to do. So I just wanted to call that out because it has been a lifesaver. And then there are aspects of financial reporting and management that I just really don't have to worry about. Right. Yeah. And then the other, the other, the very personal thing I'll share with you is that I am horrible at math. Math frightens me. It literally scares me. <laughs> I love and so, that. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, your wow. part-time controller has definitely been a lifesaver. And and we're not a big organization, right? We're very small. We're still lean and mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so having wow. uh, an organization like YPTC bring in the expertise that we really needed uh, was just really a lifesaver. And, and well, so- We, we uh, certainly ahead. couldn't have plugged that or planned that any better, yeah. but I'm thrilled yeah. to hear. <laughs> I yeah. really hear that. Absolutely. And and that's probably one of your success measures as well is, is that oversight of the financial measurement. What, what else would you say, uh, Kevin, are some of the successes for your organization? Yeah. One of the ways in which we measure success is the amount of food that we give away. Right. And actually, if uh, our watchers and our viewers visit our website today, uh, you can take a look at the quantity and the volume of food that we have given away to date. Um, what sticks out in my mind immediately is the fact that to date we have given away over 2,000 pounds of free, fresh, healthy vegetables and fruits. That says a lot. So we quantify the amount of food that we give away um, as one of the biggest indicators of our success. And then certainly another way in which we we measure our success are the stories uh, that pantry visitors are, are able to share with us about how we're able to help. Um, and particularly when they look at the, the freshness, right, uh, of the food that's in our bag, they are often 
caught by surprise. Um, okay. The other thing I'll share with you that is very unique about us, we don't give away canned goods. Um, we don't give away boxes of food that are at expiration or close to expiration. And I, and I just want to be clear in saying that there's nothing wrong with canned goods. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with boxes of food that may be very close to expiration because for someone who is experiencing hunger, they will happily accept a canned, uh, a canned good item or maybe a box of food. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not dismissing that, but our focus is on fresh and healthy. And so as a way to, uh, to demonstrate that the food that we give out on the, on our pantry, we actually pick it up from the grocery store the day of the pantry on that morning. So it is literally fresh from the grocery store um, to our pantry visitors. And again, we're focused on things like, you know, uh, fresh, healthy vegetables, fresh, healthy fruits, uh, turkey products, almond milk, um, wheat bread, right, for example, um, you know, as opposed to white bread. That matters because wheat bread promotes healthy digestion, for example. So, and, you know, those are some of the ways in which we uh, we continue to measure our success. You know, Kevin, I'm so interested in what you're saying um, on so many levels. And one of my questions, it might seem like it's coming from left field, but um, because you're not doing the normal canned good kind of mentality, are you finding that you're having to educate not only your donors and your partners, but your clients and constituency as well as to why you've taken this direction? Well, not so much education, right? I, I think that um, just in terms of our website, right, and our social media, that is where you can really take a look at our approach and our methodology and, and why we offer what we offer. Um, so maybe not so much a need for education um, beyond that, but also as we get, um, you know, foot traffic at our at our pantries, when we have opportunity to have those discussions with, with visitors um, who are actually engaging us. I mean, they're educating us, which is so encouraging and exciting because the education that they're giving to us is, you know, we really appreciate the quality of the food and the kind of food because, you know, I suspect obviously that those who are visiting our pantry are looking for other pantries as well. And so ours is just one that complements what they need. And, and so they're saying to us, you know, we are very grateful for what you offer here because it's very different than what other pantries offer. And again, I want to be very clear. The, the effort to help people who need food is a collective effort, right? So the kinds of food that other pantries are offering is great. We're part of that effort. They're part of that effort. We're all coming together to help people who need food. We're, we're just doing it in a different kind of way. So again, do we need to educate? Um, it's interesting that <laughs> quite often it's the reverse is true because our pantry visitors are educating us on the uniqueness of, of what we offer. Does that answer your question? It doesn't make sense. You know, it, it is. And what I would say to you um, that a l this is part of that, that horrible thing that we call founder syndrome. A lot of times founders are not listening to what their constituency base is. They have a, an idea and they're more forecasting that or, and, and pushing that onto the community. And so I would say for you, it bodes very well for your future that you are listening. And it sounds to me like, you know, that factors into some of your decision making. So good job. Good, good Thank job. You. I mean, Jared, I can see you smiling. <laughs> I know that doesn't happen. It doesn't. Yeah, that that doesn't happen. And for, for you, Kevin, you know, as we started, you know, not, you have the passion probably, yeah. you know, tenfold, wow. but maybe yeah. not the nonprofit experience, looking at the success for this. I love, I love that you're really paying attention to your community and what the community, you know, says and what the community is, is asking for. Um, that to me is just fantastic. Did you think two, three years ago that you would be a nonprofit, uh, yeah founder <laughs> you know this is so far removed yeah. from what i saw from okay. what i thought for what i envisioned for my life sure. and i think that that is what what gives me such a great deal of excitement right because at this particular point in my life uh, for where i am in my journey professionally mm -hmm. uh, for where i thought i would be landing in my life um, i'm not there but it's a good thing because this is work that resonates with me very personally, very personally. 
Um, and, and certainly in my professional career, um, I have found joy and fulfillment and excitement, right? But the type of joy and fulfillment and excitement that I get from this work is very different. Oh, so no, I, I, I had zero idea. I, I didn't do anything to prepare for this. You know, I did everything <laughs> that I needed to do to pre prepare for my vocation and, and my quote unquote day job. I did everything to prepare for that. I did nothing to prepare for this. Uh, I am learning along the way. And I think that that is the joy and excitement as well to be entering into um, work that is new. Everything is new right now. Everything is new. Um, and to me, that's exciting and it's fresh <laughs> and it's fun and it's helping people. I mean, what it a is, great it attitude. is helping people. <laughs> That's a fantastic attitude, Kevin. And if you didn't see yourself <laughs> two, five years ago as the founder, you know, president of Meals in the Meantime, let's look ahead, right? Where wow. where do you see yourself and where do you see your organization? What is that vision for the next three to five years? I, I absolutely seeing myself continuing this work and doing it in such a bigger way, right? And I'll just give you some examples of, of where I see our growth and where I see us headed. And so right now, um, we are providing quarterly pantries, right? My vision for 2023 is that we are providing pantries every other month, right? And then my vision for 2024 is that we are doing pantries monthly. And then beyond that, we are doing pantries as much as funding will allow. So that's one example of, of where I see our future. Um, another area where I see um, an opportunity, our future is building up our infrastructure, right? So here's the example. Um, as I share, on the day of our pantry, we go to the grocery store and we pick up the items. So it's kind of like direct from our pantry visitors to, uh, you know, from the store to the pantry visitors. And we have food transport now via either trucks that we rent or in-kind donations that we receive for trucking services from our partner. Uh, shout out to uh, Alameen Brothers Transportation. Uh, who also provides transportation for us. My vision, guys, is that I don't know when, but my vision is that at some point we have our own truck, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can rely on our own transportation methodology sure. to uh, to pick up food. Um, so, you know, those are some examples. The other, the other vision that I have for our future is that, you know, as I shared right now, we pick up food on the day of. My vision is that maybe as soon as next year or the year after, um, we have our own storage facility um, mm -hmm. for coal goods and for, and for dry goods as well. So for me, the future looks like more pantries. Um, it looks like having our own transportation um, and having our own facility for where we can store uh, and for where we can keep food. So that's what the immediate future looks like for me. I have to commend you, Kevin, because I've talked to so many founders and they want all of it right now. And what you just expressed was such a sustainable scalability of this is where I see ourselves going from quarterly to every other month, from every other month to monthly. Um, that to me speaks volumes with a business plan and what's realistic, because again, and I'm just as guilty, right? Like we're <laughs> we're an instant gratification um, you know, community, but say- yeah. We want to provide this fresh, nourishing food every single day, but you're seeing the realistic side of that. And I just, I do, I have to commend you for that because that's Thank really you. refreshing to hear. Although I'm sure it's not e always easy. Yeah. You know, because um, I, I guess on some levels, how would I call it? There is nonprofit envy. <laughs> so yes. here's what I mean by that. You know, I, I do see other nonprofits who are doing amazing work and they're doing great work and they're doing more than we are. But I have to go back to the idea that, you know, they're further along in their nonprofit journey. No, again, we're still new. Um, we were just founded uh, last year, 2021. Uh, you know, again, March 9th, 2021 is when I had the vision. And, and so I am encouraged and, and believe that slow and steady wins the race, right? Because what we always want to be focused on is the quality of the food that we provide, um, how we are providing food. And to do it that way means we just can't do it fast. It means that we have to be very strategic, very intentional and very purposeful. And you can't be strategic, intentional and purposeful fast. Um, right. That requires time. And so I'm, I'm totally okay 
with the journey being what it is, but always staying focused on our mission, right? And again, our mission is filling the food gap with nourishment and dignity. And we're going to take time to make sure that we stay on that path to do just that. So it's going to um, it's going to continue to grow. Uh, we're going to continue to do more work and, and, and I can be patient. <laughs> yeah. Well, I we don't have much time, but I have to ask, I feel like this is the elephant in the room. How has your board supported you with this vision and also, you know, supporting you since it started? Like, do they help, you know, keep everything kind of methodical in timing or talk to us a little bit in this brief amount of time about that board relationship? Yeah, I have an amazing board, um, and, and what makes that board amazing is their diversity, um, and they are very supportive of my vision and, and the dream that I have for the work that we're doing. And so, you know, I'm very cognizant and conscious to say to my board, I'm very grateful for your support of me and my vision. But even more than that, I'm grateful for your support of the work that we are doing. Um, and again, it's a diverse board, different backgrounds. We're a small but mighty board. Um, we have just recently um, increased the number. Well, including myself, we, we were a board of five. Um, and then we very recently uh, brought on two new board members. Good. And I can share with you that Good. one of the opportunities that I saw uh, for bringing on these two new board members, they are young. They are eager, they are talented, they are bright, they have ideas that just because of, uh, by virtue of their age, <laughs> they have innovation, they have just open minds. And so the entire board works, works very well together, just in terms of demographics, in terms of background. Um, and, and I could not have been blessed with a better board, absolutely. Love it. You know, I think this is great. I. I'm so appreciative that you would spend time with us today, Kevin, especially given that you are on the other side of the world. Um, yeah. And again, that's just been really exciting. I think the passion of work is something that helps us get going, but the reality of the journey is what can really be challenging. And so to hear you, uh, as Jarrett mentioned, to be so strategic and really thoughtful and thought forward um, is really great. So I, I'm excited to see how this journey takes you. I think Jarrett and I are gonna really wanna push you to come back on and, you know. I'd love to, I'd yeah, love to, thank and, you for that. And report kind of like what you're seeing and, and what other lessons that you've learned, because I'm sure every day is different. And um, Every day is different, you're, you're absolutely right. And and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a shameless plug here, if I may, um, we are, 100% funded by donations and grants. So to our, our listeners and, and those of you who are watching today, I want to invite and encourage you to go to mealsinthemeantime.org and donate as your heart uh, directs you to give. Uh, it will go to good use. Um, the bulk of our funding is toward food acquisition. So if you go to mealsinthemeantime.org, you can select the donate button right there on the home page um, and you can leave your financial gift. I love it. And you know what? I think that that's a hallmark of a strong leader. They're not afraid to ask. So absolutely. I... Not. And I'll share one more thing. Um, that is something I had to grow into um, sure. because historically I have not always felt comfortable asking people for no. money. But no. the thing is, I'm not asking for me. I'm asking right. on behalf of people who need help for food, <laughs> with food rather. Right. So that's again, right. I, I, I beg and implore you to go to our website um, and please leave your donation. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. Hey, everybody, this has been a real pleasure. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors who are with us day in and day out and have afforded us this great opportunity to talk to this new uh, nonprofit leader, Kevin Yates. We want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, Be Generous. Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. If you saw this, or if you've been watching this uh, recording, you'll see that Kevin gave the big thumbs up when we announced one of our partnering sponsors, your part-time controller, and I just love that. So thank you for witnessing to us. Hey, as we end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, and our guests, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow.